Money growth and inflation. For most students, the hardest concepts to grasp in this chapter are the most theoretical ones, the classic dichotomy and, the, and money neutrality. Most of the other material in the chapter is fairly straightforward. In the last section of this, of this chapter, costs of inflation is covered. The quote-unquote shoe leather cost is not difficult for most students to understand, but it's difficult for you to relate to. Um, due to the ready availability of ATMs and internet access um, to bank accounts, it can make it more difficult for you to understand this. Um, most of you will have a harder time learning about the arbitrary redistributions of wealth that arise when inflation is different um, from what is expected, so keep an eye out for that. Uh, this chapter is sort of longer than the average chapter, um, but to get through it more quickly, um, I'm, I'm going to really highlight the things that I think to be um, most important. Some of them are easier concepts, some of them are not, so you're obviously going to have to spend some more time um, in the textbook, in the reading, in this video, um, on the concepts that you have more difficulty understanding. Okay. Um, some of these concepts include the cost of inflation. These are menu costs, confusion, and inconvenience. The inflation tax, and then, of course, we're going to cover hyperinflation as well. So let's get started. <clears throat> as an introduction, this chapter introduces the quantity theory of money to explain one of the ten principles of economics from the chapter one of your textbooks. Um, the... the concept that we need to focus on here is that prices rise when the government prints too much money. Most economists believe that the quantity theory of money is a good explanation of the long-run behavior inflation of inflation. We know inflation occurs over the long run. We know prices go up over the long haul. This is explained by the quantity theory of money. First, let's talk about the value of money. P is the price level, of course. Um, this can be, for example, expressed in the price level changes given by uh, CPI and also the GDP deflator. P is the price of a basket of goods measured in money. So if you remember in CPI, we talked about pushing around a little shopping cart and we put certain things that we, everyone buys into a shopping cart and we see how much it costs. Well, we can measure price over time by measuring what happens to that basket of goods in terms of money what happens to the cost of that basket of goods. Now, 1 over P is the value of $1 measured in goods. Now, to make this a little more simple, here's an example. A basket, let's say, contains one candy bar. You're buying one candy bar. If the price of that candy bar is $2, then the value of $1 is one half of a candy bar. If that price goes up, the the, the dollar buys less of the candy bar, so if the price goes up to $3, the value of $1 expressed in candy bars is one-third of a candy bar. So you take the 1 and put it over the price. If the price is $2, $1 only value half a candy bar. If the price is $3, $1 would only value a third of a candy bar. Now, inflation drives up prices and drives down the value of money. As inflation continually increases prices, money will buy less. The items in our cart or in our basket go down. The, the quantity of items in our basket that we're able to buy go down, or the cost of our basket goes up, however way you want to look at it. Now, the quantity theory of money was developed by 18th century philosopher David Hume and some other classical economists, but most of it's really attributed to David Hume. Um, it's advocated more recently by Nobel Prize laureate Milton Friedman. We've talked about him before in class, if you recall. And the quantity the theory of money asserts that the quantity of money determines the value of money. We study this theory using two approaches. A supply and demand diagram, which we've done in class, and an equation. Now, the money supply, MS. In the real world, this is determined by the Fed, the banking system, and consumers. How much money is in circulation can be determined by the Fed, which can pull dollars on and onto and out of the economy. The banking system, which can loan money into the economy or hold it back. And consumers, which can choose to spend money or not. In this model, we assume the Fed precisely controls monetary supply and sets it at some fixed amount. 
um, somewhat unrealistic assumption here that we're saying everything's in the Fed's hands because there are some determinations made by banks and consumers that help determine how much money is in circulation. Now, money demand refers to how much wealth people want to hold in liquid form. Liquid form, if you recall from the previous chapter, we're talking about liquidity here. How much readily, readily available cash money do they want to hold? Now, this depends on price. An increase in price reduces the value of money, and so more money is required to buy goods and services. So if prices go up, it requires more dollars to pay for the goods and services you want to you want to get. Thus, the quantity of money demanded is negatively related to the value of money and positively related to price, all other things being equal, ceteris paribus. These other things include real income, so we're saying assuming your income doesn't change, interest rates don't change, and availability of ATMs, um, that cash is not m more easily obtained. So some of you may think that money demand is negatively related to price, uh, reasoning that an increase in price, re in, uh, excuse me, an increase in price reduces the demand for goods and services. So less money is required to buy goods and services. However, the relationship between price and money demand holds real income constant. Thus, all other things being equal means that an increase in price does not reduce real income. Therefore, it does not reduce the demand for goods and services. Um, perhaps here's another handy way to explain it. Real income determines the quantity of goods and services people demand. Okay, get more money, you want more goods and services. Price determines how many dollars will be needed to buy the goods and services. If the prices go up, you need more dollars to buy the goods and services that you demand. If they go down, you need less. Both of those speak to the value of money. Now let's take a very weird looking graph and make it hopefully somewhat simple before we make it more complicated. Here is the money supply and demand diagram. On the left axis, we have the value of money, which is that 1 over P. Okay, remember that we could buy, uh, if the price of a candy bar was $2, we could buy half, half of that candy bar. If it was um, uh, $4, we could only buy four. If, if, it, the, if the candy bar only cost a dollar, we could buy the whole thing. So that's that value of money, 1 over P. As the value of money rises, the price level falls. So um, you have price level on this right-hand axis. So yeah, we have two vertical axes here. <clears throat> the price levels, um, let's say a candy bar was $4, you could only buy one-fourth of that candy bar. Say it was $2 you could, and you only had a dollar, you could only buy half of it. Uh, if the price was one thirty-three, you could buy three-fourths, and if it was $1, you could buy the whole thing. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Now, <clears throat> continuing with the money su supply and demand diagram, uh, we have the same axes here. Uh, let's assume here the Fed sets the money supply at some fixed value regardless of price. They're going to say, this is how many dollars we're going to put into this economy. In this example, it's a thousand. We're going to put a thousand dollars in this economy. That's going to be our initial money supply. Let's take a look at demand. Again, same axes here. Um, quantity money on, is measured on the bottom here. See the quantity money? We just selected a thousand. We're going to take that off. We're going to explain the, the monetary demand here money demand line. A fall in the value of money, which is also an increase in price, increases the quantity of money demanded. So if the value of money goes down, you're going to need more of it to pay these higher prices. If the value of money is high, you're going to need less of it to pay these lower prices. Take a moment let that soak in. I'll repeat it. If the value of money is low, you're going to need more dollars. You're going to need to be over here. More dollars. Okay. If the value of money is high, meaning the prices are low, you're going to need less dollars to buy what you want, those goods and services. If it's in the middle, you're going to need some amount right here. Okay. It's where it hits this curve and comes down. Hits this curve and comes down. Hits this curve and comes down. So again, when the value of money is low, prices are high. When the value of money is high, prices are low. Okay. And thus, your demand for how many dollars you need follows accordingly. <clears throat> now, let's add a little bit to it. 
let's put them all together. Now we got the money supply and the money demand on the same graph. We understand where the uh, axes are, left and right, and then the, obviously the horizontal axes. Uh, you have your money supply one, you have your money demand one, and we have an equilibrium where the money supply equals the money demand, labeled here as point A. The equilibrium value of money here is one half. So think about um, uh, the price of that candy bar must be two dollars, which means every dollar that we have can buy half of a candy bar. Okay, so it takes two dollars to buy a whole candy bar. We have a dollar, we can only buy half of it. All right. Well, given that equilibrium and the fact that there's a thousand dollars in the market, we have a better understanding that price adjusts to equate the quantity of money demanded with the money supply. Price, price adjusts to equate um, quantity of money demanded right here. Here's, here's where your demand line is with the given money supply. So price comes to this equilibrium. Remember, the money supply is given and your money demand schedule is just a response to, hey, if, if I have a, a high value of money, my prices are here, I need a lower quantity. If I have a low value of money, I need a higher quantity of, of dollars to buy things like candy bars. Okay? Well, in here, price is going to come to wherever this equilibrium is. So it's a little counterintuitive to traditional supply and demand, but in a sense, it is traditional supply and demand. It's just that price adjusts to equate um, quantity of money Okay, the quantity of money, $1,000 in this example, demanded with the money supply. Okay. Now, the effects of a monetary injection. All right. Now, in the previous chapter, we talked about what if the Fed puts more money into the economy. They print more money. This goes back to that principle of economics. What's going to happen here? Well, we move from our initial monetary supply here, MS1, which was $1,000. Let's say they double it to $2,000 in this economy. So we have uh, money supply two. We move from uh, equilibrium A to equilibrium B. Demand remains the same. So suppose the Fed increases the money supply from um, money supply one to money supply two. The equilibrium value of money goes down. Dollars are less scarce, meaning they're more abundant, thus they're less, less valuable. Then the value of money falls, because they're less scarce, and price rises, because it takes more dollars to buy the goods and services that you want. That candy bar price is going up. That's inflation. So you put more dollars in the economy, they lose value, and prices are going to increase. Okay. Now... Some students may struggle with the fact that, oh yeah, this goes from one all the way down to fourth. I can see starting up high and going low. You've got to remember it's just the inverse on the price level. Uh, as you're moving down this axis, the price level is getting higher. So this is makes actual intuitive sense. Put more dollars out there, they're less scarce, they lose value. Then prices move accordingly and increase from two to four here. Now, let's take a brief look at the adjustment process. Here's a result from the graph. Increasing money supply causes prices to rise. How does this work? Well, the short version is, after the initial price, an increase in money supply causes an excess in supply of money. Now, people get rid of their excess money by spending it on goods and services or by loaning it to others who spend it. The result is an increased demand for goods. But so the, the supply of good does, goods and services do not increase, so the price must rise. Other things happen in the short run, which we'll study in, in, in some later chapters, believe it or not. Um, but the meat of it here is there's more dollars in the economy, more things that people are spending on. Um, there is perhaps more demand for services, goods and services. However, uh, with more dollars out there, it takes more dollars to buy things like candy bars. So the prices are going to rise over time. Now, let's take a look at real um, versus... Uh, nominal variables. Now nominal variables, again, you should remember this when we talked about real and nominal GDP. Nominal variables though, emphasis on variables, are measured in monetary units. An example is nominal GDP. Nominal interest rates, uh, rate of return measured in dollars, and nominal wage, the, the dollars per hour worked. Okay, those are all nominal. They're not, they're not in real terms in accounting for inflation. Now real variables are measured in physical units. Okay, so we got monetary units versus physical units. Again, we're talking variables here. We're not talking real versus nominal dollars here. We're talking variables. So real var variables are measured in physical units. 
Examples are real GDP, real interest rate, which is measured in output, and real wage, which is measured in output. Now, uh, most students seem to readily understand that the real wage is the purchasing power of the wage, what you can put in that market basket, or that real wage is corrected for inflation. From either of these interpretations of the real wage, it's just a small step to understand that real wage is measured in the units of output. What does the quote-unquote purchasing power of wage really mean? If you were to think about it, um, you would grasp it that it means that the quantity of outputs workers can buy with their wage. It's the stuff you can buy with your wage. Hence, the real wage is measured in units of output. Okay, stuff, goods and services that you buy, you can measure that in terms of units. What does the quote-unquote corrected for inflation mean? Well, a simple example helps. Suppose that the nominal wage ri rises by 20% and the price level also rises by 20% you will immediately understand that the wage corrected for inflation is unchanged because wages went up 20%, prices went up 20%. Which is to say it can buy the same quantity of output as before. Okay, so your market basket doesn't get lighter. Now the next slide, slide discusses relative prices demonstrating that they too are measured in physical units, which makes them real variables. The following slide returns to real wage, showing that it is a relative price and understanding that it's measured in units of output. Basically, what can you buy? How is it that the real interest rate is measured in output? Suppose we measure the value of a deposit in terms of how much output the deposit can buy. For example, the purchasing power of a deposit. What can it buy? Then think of the real interest rate as the rate at which purchasing power of the deposit grows. So interest rates are going to grow the number of dollars you have. It technically should grow the amount of goods and services you can purchase. Thinking in these terms, you should begin to grasp the real interest rate is the amount of output earned on the deposit as a percentage of the deposit. A lot of information at once. Again, no single aspect of this course and these concepts is going to get it for you. Okay, Watching this video once won't do it. Perhaps maybe watching it twice will help you, but certainly doing the reading is going to hammer it home and then lecture on top of that, and you'll stand a real good chance. Now, continue with real versus nominal variable. Prices are normally measured <clears throat> in terms of money. Let's look at the price of a compact disc. Yeah, we used to have those called a CD. Yeah, I don't even know if you know what that is anymore with all the MP3s and stuff we got going on iTunes. But yeah, compact disc, a CD. $15 per CD. That's, that's a reasonable price. And then the price of a pepperoni pizza, about $10 per pizza. I think you would think that was reasonable as well. A relative price is the price of one good relative, um, relative to, another fancy word, way of saying, divided by another. So relative price of CDs in terms of pizzas. Uh, you take the price of a CD and you place it over the price of a pizza in a ratio. And that would be $15 per CD over $10 per pizza. Okay, You could have one and a half pizzas per CD. Okay, So you could express... The price of CDs and pizzas. One CD equals one and a half pizzas. The relative prices are measured in physical units, so they are real variables. Again, real variables. Okay, One expressed in the value of another. It takes one and a half pizzas to get a CD. Anyone think opportunity costs if you're deciding between buying CDs and pizzas here? Real versus nominal wage, emphasis on wage. An important relative price is an important relative price is the real wage. Now, W is the nominal wage. Nominal, nominal, nominal wage. The price of labor. For example, you get paid $15 an hour. The P is the price level. It's the price of a good or service. Example, you pay $5 per uh, per unit of output. <clears throat> Real wage is the price of labor relative to the price of output. So what you're buying is, is, is $5 and what you earn is $15 an hour. Your weight, nominal wage over the price level, you have $15 an hour and what you're interested in is in $5 per unit of output. You can thusly buy three units of something giving per hour that you work. So if you work one hour, you get 15 bucks on what you want to pay or the good and service you want to buy is five bucks. Well, after an hour, assuming we don't have taxes here, which was a nice assumption, not realistic, but assumption, nice assumption, you could buy three units of whatever that good and service is that you want to buy after working an hour. So you could think of your wage as um, a means to buy someone else's output of good and service. Now, 
This brings us to the classical dichotomy. <clears throat> the classical, <clears throat> excuse me, the classical um, dichotomy is the theoretical separation of nominal and real variables. Hume, David Hume, we talked about previously, and the classical economist suggested that the that monetary developments affect nominal variables but not real variables. Interesting. If a central bank doubles the money supply, Hume and the classical thinkers contend that all nominal variables, including prices, will double. All real variables, including relative prices, will remain unchanged. Basically, you buy what you buy. Prices may change, but you're going to buy what you buy. But there are some other changes here. Let's talk about neutrality of money. Money neutrality is the proposition that changes... Uh, that changes in the money supply do not affect real variables. I mean, real variables are those things of output that we're buying. Doubling the money, the money supply causes all nominal prices to double. What happens to relative prices, though? Initially, the relative price of CDs in terms of pizza is, we had that $15 uh, for a CD over $10 in a pizza, uh, for a pizza, rather. That means that one and a half pizzas per CD after the nominal prices double, CDs go to 30, pizzas go to 20, we're still having to give up one and a half pizzas per CD. This result is important because relative prices, not nominal prices, determine the economy's allocation of resources. Again, let me repeat that. This is important because relative prices, the relative price of a CD, relative price of a pizza, not the nominal prices of a CD or a pizza, determine the economy's allocation of resources. Now, again, <clears throat> monetary uh, neutrality, the proposition that changes in the money supply do not affect real variables. Similarly, the real wage, remember that wage over prices, remains unchanged. So that would mean that the quantity of labor supply does not change, the quantity of labor demanded does not change, and total employment of labor does not change. The same applies to the employment of capital and other resources. So if we're talking capital given prices or wages given prices, the, the, these these neutrality of money holds. Since employment of all resources un is unchanged, the total output is unchanged by the money supply. The material on this slide does not appear explicitly in the chapter, but it may help explain how money can be neutral. You double it, it's going to not affect the labor supply, it's going to not affect the labor demand, it's going to not affect the em employment of labor as long as everything doubles along with it, like the pizza and CD example. Most economists believe that the classical dichotomy and neutrality of money describe the economy in the long run. We've talked about that before in class. Uh, if there's a ton of new dollars on the market. Um, there's going to be a short run initial splurge in spending, but over time the value of money goes down because money is far less scarce and prices go up. In later chapters, we'll see that monetary changes can have sh important short run effects on real variables, i.e. increased spending on those real variables. Now, <clears throat> let's talk about the velocity of money. Velocity of money is the rate at which money changes hands. Think about the speed at which people are spending. There's an important notation here in that P times Y is nominal GDP. Price times output, current price level times the current output, which is um, real GDP, um, is nominal GDP. Now, M is the money supply and V is velocity. Thus, velocity equals that nominal GDP divided by the money supply. The textbook definition of velocity appears on this slide, but you may, pref you may prefer for me to use a more precise definition in that the number of transactions in which the average dollar is used. How fast is that dollar going through the economy? The following, supply, uh, the following slide, I should say, provides a simple explanation to clarify the meaning of velocity. So let's go there. Again, the velocity formula is money velocity equals uh, your price times output over the money supply. <clears throat> Let's take an example with one good, pizza. In 2012, the output, the real GDP, let's say was 3,000 pizzas. The price level, let's keep our same price that we are using our previous example, the price of a pizza was $10. Price times output, which is nominal GDP, is the value of the pizzas. That 10 times 3,000, P times Y, is 30,000. Let's say the money supply was $10,000 total in the economy. Well, that means that the velocity is the total number of pizzas bought, okay, bought and sold, 30,000, divided by the total amount of money, which is 3. 
Thus, the average dollar was used in three transactions. Very, very simplified example here, but it should give you an average, or, or excuse me, a better understanding of how the average dollar was used in transactions in terms of pizza. Um, each dollar went through at least three transactions buying pizza. So if 10,000 worth of, there's 10,000 worth of money purchases 30, excuse me, if there's $10,000 in the market or in the economy, so there's $10,000 um, worth of money purchasing $30,000 worth of pizzas, it must be true that the average dollar is used three times. So the velocity is three. So how many times did the dollar go through this transaction? <clears throat> Important slide. I probably would ask that one on the test. Very simple example. You just need to tell me how many times the dollar come through that transaction. The velocity would be three. So take a moment and let that one soak in if you want to pause the slide. I kind of like that one. Now, <clears throat> the quantity equation. If the velocity formula is v equals the output times or yeah the output times price over the money supply you could technically multiply both sides of the formula by the money supply okay that would cancel out the uh, m underneath p times x and then you would have on the other side of the equation m times v and m times v equals p times x would be the quantity equation now, quantity theory in five steps. Start with that quantity equation we just derived, m times v equals p times x, so the money supply times velocity equals the price times output. Well, v is stable, the velocity. How, how those dollars are moving in and out of the economy is stable. So a change in m, the money supply, causes nominal GDP, p times x, to change by the same percentage. Think back to that graph. That's just saying the exact same thing. Price has doubled. A, if, if money supply doubled, so that, that makes sense. A change in the money supply does not affect Y. Money is neutral, so it doesn't affect output. Money is neutral. Y is determined by technology and resources. Right? Money uh, fluctuates on its own. How, you, how much you can produce depends on the resources you have and the technology you have to produce. And if you had a great big increase in technology that made production more efficient, perhaps your output would go up, but the money part of it has nothing to do with it. So price changes by the same percentage as price times output and money growth. So price changes by the same percentage as uh, nominal GDP and the money supply. So price is going to be very... Um, very dependent on the money supply and output, um, or, or GDP, I should say. <clears throat> now, rapid money supply growth can cause rapid inflation. So, money supply is tied to prices, and if prices go up, that's inflation. Thus, rapid money supply causes rapid inflation. Pretty simple. Now, if there's a lot of inflation... Hyperinflation is generally defined as inflation exceeding 50% per month. Now, that's a real big problem. Hyperinflation is a real big problem. Again, generally defined as inflation exceeding 50% per month. So, inflation's increases in prices are greater than... Hyperinflation is increases in prices greater than 50% per month. Recall, one of the 10 principles of economics from Chapter 1 is that prices rise when the government prints too much money. Okay? Excessive growth in the money supply always causes hyperinflation. Again, excessive growth in the money supply. So like huge jumps in the money supply. People just dumping money. Government just printing more money and putting it out in the economy will always cause hyperinflation. Incredible increases in prices over time. Classic example of hyperinflation of Zim, um, uh, comes from Zimbabwe. Large government budget deficits led to the creation of large quantities of money and high inflation rates. Some politicians think, hey, we got bills to pay. All we got to do is print more money to pay them. Well, here's what happens. You run a large government deficit. You say, hey, let's just print a large quantity of money and pay off our, our stuff. That'll work. They don't think about the high inflation rates. Okay? All right. Now, look, uh, the Zimbabwe dollar per U.S. dollar. In August 2007, one Zimbabwe dollar, um, or excuse me, it would have taken 245 Zimbabwean dollars, I should say, for one U.S. dollar. Okay. Less than a year later, 
it would have taken 29,401 Zimbabwean dollars to equal one U.S. dollar. A month later, 207 million, okay? 4.4 billion, 26.4 billion, 37 million, 355. You know why it spiked like this? In this area right here, they decided, hey, let's just print money and pay our bills. Yeah, that's what happens to your dollars. They become worthless. In fact, they're worth less than toilet paper. Hey, in this toilet, please only flush toilet paper. Please don't flush cardboard. That'll clog it. Please don't flush cloth. That'll clog it. Please don't flush newspaper down this toilet. That'll clog it. Oh, by the way, since you have so many of these Zimbabwean dollars... Did I say million? Let's see. Let's do the math on here. Took 29000 in April... 29,000 Zimbabwean dollars to equal um, one U.S. dollar. Then all of a sudden it was 207 million Zimbabweans to get one U.S. dollar. Remember, that's only like half a candy bar in an earlier example. Um, and then in June, they said, yeah, let's keep printing money and pay our bills. Uh, let's see, that's hundreds of thousands, millions. Uh, wouldn't that be billions? It took like $4.4 billion to have one U.S. dollar. $26.4 billion to have one U.S. dollar. $37 million. This says a lot about the value, the, what, what printing money can do to the value of money. You print too much of it, it's going to be worthless. In this example, yeah, please don't wipe your tail with Zimbabwean dollars and flush them. You know why? Because Zimbabwean dollars were less expensive than toilet paper. This is a real sign, by the way. Bananas. Hyperinflation is bananas. You're taking your money to the supermarket in a wheelbarrow. Okay, big problems. Now, the inflation tax. When the tax revenue is inadequate <clears throat> and the ability to borrow is limited, the government may print money to pay for its spending. ruh -ru, we see how that goes. Almost all hyperinflation start this way. See Germany in the 1930s. See Zimbabwe in 2008-2009. Um, the revenue from printing money is the inflation tax. Printing money causes inflation, right? So prices go up. When prices go up on you, it doesn't. Your salary is not going to immediately go up. You're paying a tax. Your the dollars you are earning today, you're going to earn the same amount tomorrow. Yet it's worth significantly less. Well, the difference you could see it as a tax. You could call it an inflation tax. So printing money causes inflation, which is like a tax on everyone who holds money. You're losing value. That lost value is the tax. In the U.S., the inflation tax today accounts for less than 3% of total revenue. Okay, so if you have like a 3% inflation rate, uh, your salary doesn't go up. You just, congratulations, paid a 3% inflation tax. Very important to keep an eye on prices over time so you know... If you're getting a pay raise when they offer you, say, a 3% increase, or if you're taking a pay cut. <clears throat> interesting, interesting, interesting. Now let's talk about the Fisher effect. We can rearrange the definition for real interest rates. Nominal interest rate equals the inflation rate plus the real interest rate. Okay, So if you take inflation and add it to the real interest rate, you have a nominal interest rate. The real interest rate is determined by the saving and investment in the loanable funds market, which we talked about previously. Money supply growth determines the inflation rate. As money supply grows more, the inflation rate grows more. So this equation shows how nominal interest rate is determined. It's simply the real interest rate plus inflation. Now, um, pardon me. <clears throat> so this equation shows how the nominal interest rate is determined. Nominal interest rate is the inflation rate plus the real interest rate. So again, in the long run, money is neutral. A change in money growth rate affects the inflation rate, but not the real interest rate. Okay, let me say that again. In the long run, money is neutral. A change in money growth rate affects the inflation rate, but not the real interest rate. Because the real interest rate takes inflation out of it. Okay, real interest rate is going to grow at a rate that the actual interest rate grows. If you add inflation in that, it's a bit distorting. So that's how you get a nominal interest rate. So the nominal interest rate adjusts one for one with the changes in the inflation rate. Okay, The only thing that's changing in the nominal interest rate, if you control for the real interest rate, is the inflation rate. It's the thing pumping things up. Dare I say it's inflating it. 
This relationship is called the Fisher effect after Urban Fisher, who studied it. Okay. The Fisher effect, uh, effect in the inflation tax. The inflation tax applies to people's holdings of money, not their holdings of wealth. Wealth can be other things like real estate uh, assets that you hold. It's the people's holding of money that we're interested, interested in here. The Fisher effect is an increase in inflation causes an equal increase in the nominal interest rate. So the real interest rate on wealth is unchanged. It can just be overinflated due to inflation. Now the cost of inflation, the inflation is, uh, the first thing we need to cover when we talk about the cost of inflation is the inflation fallacy. Most people think inflation erodes real incomes. But inflation in general increases in prices, uh, increase, let me start over but inflation is a general increase in prices of things people buy and things that they sell, i.e. their labor. In the long run, real incomes are determined by real variables and not the inflation, things that you can buy. Okay. The contention I have here, and when I slightly disagree with the Fisher effect here, is that your salaries, your wages, are much more sticky than prices. A store can go and change prices like crazy. However, it's hard for me, you, and everyone to get a raise to keep up with the inflations, especially in a poor economy. So keep that in mind. Now, the cost of inflation. Let's take a look at shoe leather costs and menu costs. Shoe leather costs are the resources wasted when inflation encourages people to reduce their money holdings. So money becomes less valuable. The shoe leather cost is their response in that the money, uh, they hold less of it. So this includes the time and transactions cost of more frequent bank withdrawals. So if you take your money in and out of the bank, there's, there's potentially some transactions costs, opportunity costs, gas going to the bank so many times to withdraw your money to change your, your holdings from... Uh, money to say other assets like gold or something like that. Now, there's, sh there's menu costs. Um, restaurants don't always respond, let's say for example a restaurant, to the cost of changing prices because they have to print new menus, mail new catalogs, new to-go menus, all these things. They have to change a lot. There's a cost to that. So perhaps prices get a little bit sticky. Um, I think, I, I, this is just my out-of-pocket observational theory here. I have noticed that a lot of restaurants have went to um, paper menus. Uh, it just seems like to me, even the fancy restaurants, they've gone to the nice menu covers, okay, but then they have a paper menu inserted in there. Why? So they can avoid menu costs. They can change prices as inflation occurs, okay? That's just a personal theory. I have no proof of it, but observation is very powerful. Now, there can be a mis misallocation of resources from the relative price variability. Firms don't always um, don't all raise prices at the same time, so the relative prices can vary. This distorts the allocation of resources. Some firms are a little more on the ball in terms of observing the market costs and adjusting their prices quicker than others, so there can be a misallocation of resources from relative price variability. Uh, there also is confusion and inconvenience. Inflation changes the yardstick, remember prices, we use to measure transactions. Okay. We talked about money as a yardstick in the previous chapter. This complicates long-range run, long range planning and the comparison of dollar amounts over time. It creates confusion and the inconvenience of having to sort through what is real and what is nominal. There's also tax distortions. The inflation, inflation makes nominal income grow faster than real income. Okay? can't say that I completely agree with this. There will be increased wages over time. There always has been. If you look back to the movie price of uh, in the 1920s versus a movie price now, okay, there was an increase in prices. And if you look at wages, there was an increase in wages. So it does happen over the long run. However, in the short run, wages are pretty sticky. Now, taxes are based on nominal income, and some are not adjusted for inflation. So inflation causes people to pay more taxes even when their in real incomes don't increase. Bingo. When you pay more taxes, even though your real incomes don't increase, it's a, it's a lot like paying a tax, okay? But it's also a lot like taking a pay cut. Bingo. Bingo, bingo, bingo. These inflation can distort the market the same way a tax can, and we know how we feel about taxes. 
So a special cost to, uh, of un unexpected inflation is the arbitrary redistributions of wealth. Higher than expected inflation transfers purchasing power from creditors to debtors. Now think about this. Debtors get to repay their debt with dollars that aren't worth as much. They're not as valuable. So you get to repay it. They're not as valuable. So you, you used it to buy something when it had more value. Okay. Lower than expected inflation transfers purchasing power from debtors to creditors. All right. Banks pay really, really smart people to project the value of a dollar when setting their interest rates, okay? They set them um, too low and inflation gets, you know, increases more than they anticipate. The creditors actually take a hit. And if they set them a little higher than if there's underwhelming inflation, the banks get a little more return, okay? They anticipated inflation to be a little higher. It's not as high as it was, so they're getting a more valuable dollar at a higher rate. So depending on the rate of inflation, given what, what uh, creditors and debtors, debtors have on hand, it can redistribute wealth. The creditors can be winners. The debtors can be winners. High inflation is more variable and less predictor, uh, predictable than low inflation. Okay? High inflation is much less predictable. Okay? Low inflation is not really the expectation. Okay? High inflation is you have a lot of variability and it can change things fast. So these arbitrary redistribution wealths are frequent when inflation is high. For many of you, this is one of the harder concepts in the chapter. You might consider uh, working through problem 10 and the problem and applications at the end of the chapter to practice on this concept. We'll probably do that in class as well on the board. So um, take a moment to examine that one. Okay, just remember, lower than expected inflation transfers purchasing power from debtors to creditors. Okay. High inf um, and debtors, uh, higher than expected inflation transfers purchasing power from creditors to debtors. Okay. People can pay off their loans more easily, yet the value of the dollar is lower. The cost of inflation. All of these costs are quite high for economies experiencing hyperinflation. If, if these are the costs at inflation, you can bet your bottom dollar that they are significant costs at hyperinflation. Think about Zimbabwe. For economies with low inflation, say less than 10% per year, these costs are probably much smaller and less, less, have less of an impact, though their exact size is open to debate. Economists can't agree on this, so um, there's a lot of back and forth in this area. Now, in conclusion, this chapter explains one of the 10 principles of economics reviewed in Chapter 1. Prices rise when government prints too much money. Emphasis on too much money. We saw that money is neutral in the long run, affecting only nominal variables not the real variables. You're going to buy what you buy. In later chapters, we will see that money has important effects in the short run on real variables like output and employment. That's upcoming. So in summary, <clears throat> to explain inflation in the long run, economists use the quantity theory of money. According to this theory, the price level depends on the quantity of money and the inflation rate depends on the money growth rate. The classic dichotomy is the division between variables into real and nominal. The neutrality of money is that the idea that changes in the money supply affect nominal variables, not, not, but not necessarily real variables, goods and services that you buy. Most economists, so your cart becomes more expensive, but you're still putting the same things in the cart. That's basically what that means. Most economists believe that these ideas describe the economy in the long run. In the long run, there's more money out there. Prices are going to go up. The dollar's not worth as much. The inflation tax is the loss of real value of people's money holdings when the government causes inflation by printing money. The Fisher effect is the one-for-one -one relation between changes in inflation rate and the changes in nominal interest rate. Okay, what's your real interest rate versus your nominal interest rate? The costs of inflation include menu costs, shoe leather costs, confusion and inconvenience, and distortions in relative prices and the allocation of resources, tax distortions, and arbitrary redistribu redistributions of wealth, largely between creditors and debtors, uh, debtors I should say, um, and then also between, um, I would add, between rich and poor. Uh, high increases in prices uh, in the short and long run, especially in the long run, I would say would be more regressive, um, just like a tax would be, on the poor who have limited resources to increase their pay than it would be on the rich. So just some interesting considerations there. Very theoretical chapter, very 
applicable chapter, very realistic chapter, but a lot of theoretics that you guys probably aren't that familiar with, so it's going to take some repetition to get this down. Um, if you have any questions, um, once you've done those reps and you don't understand something, uh, please let me know. Send me a message. Come by. I'll be happy to talk to you. Thank you so much. And that was Money Growth and Inflation.